Starting in mid-1943, the long-awaited products of America's industrial power began to arrive at Pearl Harbor. The Navy commissioned five Essex-class carriers, the first two battleships of the Iowa class, all nine Independence-class carriers, and 11 cruisers during 1943. The seemingly endless parade of new ships and aircraft arriving in Hawaii not only radically transformed the size and structure of the fleet, but also dramatically affected strategy and tactics on both sides in the war. In early 1944, when the Navy's brass decided to flex its newfound muscle in a major operation, they chose the Japanese Navy's legendary main fleet base at Truck Adel in the Caroline Islands as their target. Today, Battlestars salutes Vice Admiral Raymond A. Spruance and Battleship New Jersey, his flagship for Operation Hailstone, one of the most successful raids in American naval history. After the landing force suffered heavy losses at Tarawa in November 1943, the admirals asked, could the Japanese be driven from Truk without an amphibious attack? Truk had a largely exaggerated reputation as an impregnable stronghold. By early 1944, due to the scarcity of fuel and the threat of submarines, the bulk of the Japanese combined fleet rode at anchor inside its spacious lagoon, safely out of range of naval gunfire. Significantly. Truck had five airfields, still home at any given time to as many as 400 aircraft. The mere threat of attack, which after Tarawa had been raised became known as a Spruance haircut, accomplished much of the first objective. When two Marine Corps PB-4Y1 Liberators conducted the first American high-altitude photo reconnaissance mission over Truck on February 4, 1944, the significance of their appearance was not lost on Admiral Minichi Koga, commander of the combined fleet. Within days, most of his ships had withdrawn to Palau. Koga packed up and left for Japan in battleship Musashi. Vice Admiral Raymond A. Spruance, commanding the Central Pacific Force and the 5th Fleet, intended to flatten truck, preventing its aircraft from interfering with simultaneous landings in the Marshall Islands and sink as many ships as possible. For this operation, Spruance broke his flag in battleship New Jersey newly arrived in the Pacific on February 9th. Four days later, Task Force 50 cleared Majuro Atoll. The armada included nine carriers, six fast battleships, and ten cruisers. On February 17th, Admiral Spruance unleashed history's greatest concentration of carrier air power to date. With 500 aircraft at his disposal, Rear Admiral Mark A. Mitcher, commanding the fast carriers, tested new tactics. The day started with an unprecedented 72-plane fighter sweep. Marine Corps ace Gregory Pappy Boyington, who had been shot down and captured in January, watched from a slit trench as strafing Hellcats blasted the transport plane in which he had arrived only moments earlier. Following the fighters, TBF-1C Avengers, armed with incendiaries and cluster bombs, targeted the airfields and shipping. These tactics, as well as keeping a near-continuous stream of attacking aircraft over truck, were all new. Air opposition ceased by the afternoon. Before the aviators stole the show entirely, Spruance decided to take a victory lap around truck. He also raised more than a few eyebrows when he formed and took tactical command of a surface action group that included New Jersey and her sister ship Iowa. Spruance was anything but reckless, but the staff knew that he had not handled ships in a long time. There would be hell to pay for everyone if he ran a new battleship aground or into a minefield. Even so, onward they steamed in a single column, with four destroyers in front, heavy cruisers Minneapolis and New Orleans next, then New Jersey and Iowa on a counterclockwise cruise around the atoll to catch fugitives and bombard shore installations. Spruance's group soon caught up to a group of four ships led by light cruiser Katori, destroyers Mikazi and Nawaki and an armed trawler. Aircraft had hit them already. For starters, New Jersey's five-inch guns sank the trawler. Spruance ordered aircraft to stand down so his cruisers and destroyers could finish off the rest. 
When the heavy cruisers required the battleships to intervene, Iowa expended 46 16-inch rounds and 124 5-inch rounds on Katori, which rolled over and sank, but not before firing torpedoes. In her death throes, Mikazi also launched a salvo of torpedoes at the battleships. Only a warning from an aircraft gave New Jersey adequate time to maneuver, and the torpedoes passed close aboard. Spruance reputedly remarked, that would have been embarrassing. Iowa wasn't warned at all. According to Iowa's action report, a torpedo streaked down her port side, another passed close under the stern, and a third passed ahead. Destroyer Nowaki, freed from the melee, provided the day's final highlight. When a float plane from New Jersey spotted the fleeing destroyer over the horizon, New Jersey and Iowa pursued at more than 30 knots, opening fire straight ahead at extreme ranges. New Jersey straddled Nowaki several times, including at a range of 35,700 yards. New Jersey's last salvo, fired from the impressive range of 22 miles, is believed to be the longest range gunshot at an enemy ship in history. For our Hold on a moment. I'll take this part. For our viewers familiar with the Delaware Valley, imagine New Jersey, from its current location in Camden, firing over the city of Philadelphia and purposely dropping a salvo of 16-inch shells into the northern end of Sweetbriar Park in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. But on this day, both ships were moving at more than 30 knots. Thank you, Ryan. Maybe they should make you the new voiceover guy. Though showered with splinters, Nowaki escaped. This engagement was the first and last time an Iowa-class battleship took enemy warships under fire. As the saying goes, all's well that ends well. After triumphantly circling truck, Admiral Spruance ordered his ships to hoist their large victory flags. Spruance didn't hit and run, as doctrine advised. On February 18th, between midnight and dawn, Mitcher launched a highly successful night carrier bombing attack against the remaining shipping in Truck Lagoon, the first of its kind. Air attacks continued after dawn. In two days, aircraft flew 1,250 combat sorties. Though aviators had expected better results, given the amount of ordnance used, the Japanese lost between 250 to 275 aircraft and 75% of their supplies and equipment on truck. Japanese shipping losses amounted to two light cruisers, four destroyers, five tankers, and 29 other ships. Task Force 50 lost 40 men killed, 25 aircraft and one carrier damaged by an aerial torpedo. Though still mastering the art of power projection, the U.S. Navy had reduced truck to a backwater post without an amphibious assault or the support of land-based aircraft. So thorough was the base's demolition that, several weeks later, the Joint Chiefs of Staff chose to bypass it officially. In the Navy's growing strength, everything that had seemed impossible during the dark days of 1942 suddenly became possible, even inevitable, in 1944. As a postscript, in June 1944, when Admiral Nimitz created a shuttle system by which Admiral Spruance and Admiral William F. Halsey alternated planning their next offensive ashore and commanding the fleet at sea, both men chose Battleship New Jersey as their flagship. Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator of Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. If you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe.